would, grab your Bibles and open up to the book of Romans chapter 15. Um, this morning we're going to be covering verses 1 through 13 of this chapter. And if you've been traveling with us through the scriptures for any length of time and you can do a little bit of math, you may say chapter 15 is before 16 and after 16, we're done. Like we'll have finally navigated through this glorious grand book known as the book of Romans with really its theme its central point, its thing that it's calling you to call, bring your attention to is the good news of Jesus. Now, this morning, as we look at these first 13 verses, I'm going to kind of entitle our time together in this way. Making your days doxological. Now, I love the alliteration, but you may say, what the heck is that and why should I care? Like doxological, is that like a breed of dachshund, the German, you know, German dog? Like what in the world, doxological, what is the, what is the meaning of this? Why does this matter? Why would you phrase it this way? And honestly, why would I even care? Well, hopefully that'll make a little bit more sense as we navigate and study the scriptures this morning. But I will say this, let me have your attention, let me see your eyes. Whether you know it or not, a doxological lifestyle is the purpose of your life. The purpose of your life. But I need you to hang with me for a second. See, everything that we'll be learning and leaning into in the scriptures this morning is all framed on this foundation of the gospel. See, here's the challenge. If you've already checked out, all you're going to hear from me this morning is like, that sounds kind of legalistic. Like, I got to do, 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 do to be a believer. And life for you will, like that little do, it'll stink. Like it'll do, do. It's like, that's not the way Christianity is meant to be lived. It's li meant to be lived in light of what God's done. And let me share with you the benefits, the dynamics, the realities of the gospel in your life if your faith is in Jesus. If your faith is in Jesus, you have been forgiven. You have been set free. You're a part of a family, and you've got a future. Forgiven, free, family, and future. Every single human being on this stage, in this little room, and online, we're all born not yet children of God. God doesn't have any grandchildren. Every single person is a, is a first-generation Christian. Maybe you've heard that before. Well, I'm a third-generation Christian. No, you're not. That's, there's no such thing. You have to have a personal relationship with Jesus, where as he put it, you have to be born again. Being born and going to church and growing up into that, that's great. Like you get a little bit of insight into who he is, but going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Knowing the Bible, even in the old King Jimmy, right? The old King James, that doesn't do nothing for you. If your heart hasn't been transformed and regenerated by his Holy Spirit, and you're experiencing a vital relationship with him. Well, for you, this isn't good news today. This is the, the great bummer to have to take a beautiful day like this and sit in here and talk to some guy, listen to some guy. Like, why are you doing that? That's a waste of time. But if you've been redeemed, if you've been forgiven, and you're experiencing that freedom and you recognize that you've been brought into a family and you know where you're going, I hope and pray that gathering together as believers... It's encouraging. But I also hope this. Let me just kind of show you my cards if I can. I got to be honest with you. Sunday mornings, I know this may be like countercultural, especially in the American church. It's not really about you. Like Sunday mornings is, is really about God. Like I know so much of what happens in the church nowadays is like, well, how do we get them in? How do we relate? How do we stay current? How? But here's the challenge of that. The purpose of a gathered corporate worship gathering is for it to be about the one that we're worshiping. I know that may seem like, wow, that's too deep, but like it's meant to be about God. And this opportunity is for us to hear from God. And then there's some opportunities. I'll give you seven handles. Learning God's word, fellowshipping with God's people, praying to God, singing praises about God, serving one another, giving and what we're doing this morning, taking communion, here's an opportunity for you to worship, to adore, to glorify God. Yes, there's benefits from it, don't get me wrong, 
But ultimately, this space, this time, you can kind of like take it off. We're not here to kind of meet every spiritual need that you like. The temperature is about half a degree warmer than I want it to be. I'm not coming back. Like, okay. Like church is designed to glorify God. And when a church functions in its design, fruit is produced. Life comes from that. And this morning, everything that you're going to hear about living or making your days doxological, it's kind of like built on that foundation of this beautiful reality that God has saved you, that he's changing you, that he's brought you into a family and he's leading you to a place where there's a great future and a great hope. And where we are in this section of Romans is we're learning how, now how to live in light of that, especially when things are just not cool, like when there's division, when there's frustration, where there's challenges in relationship. See, that's the dynamic of Romans for the early Christians that would have been hearing this letter read for the first time. You had primarily these two kind of groups of people who weren't really identified so much by their race, but they were more identified not so much by their socioeconomic standing, but really by their religious ethnic background. That was the divider line. Today our culture is different, but in that culture it was like, Either you're ethnic Jewish Christian or you're not, Jew or Gentile. That was really like the two camps. And like, you know, there were the kosher crew and then there was the crew that, that just, you know, could care less kind of crew. And, but they were together in the church. And they had these dynamics. And if you want to summarize in the New Testament some of the most challenging dynamics in the church. Yeah, crying babies, that's a challenging dynamic. But, but like more than that. Like in the church, the biggest dynamics of concern were these three C's. Calendar, calories, and circumcision. That's what the church kind of constantly fought about. Like, do we still need to do these things as Christians? And, and in Romans 14 and 15, you may remember that what we're looking at is special diets and special days. Like some believe that meat offered to idols was like a no, no, no. And others said it's no thing. And then other believers said, well, you need to keep Rosh Hashanah, Passover, Feast of Tabernacles, special days, Sabbath, Shabbat. And the Gentile, those non-ethnic Jews are like, what's the deal, man? There was frustration, there was division. And so look at what Paul says in Romans 15. I'm going to be reading from the uh, New Living Translation. He says this, we who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. Those things, diets and days. We must not... Pay attention to this. We must not just please ourselves. We should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. Even Christ didn't live to please himself. As the scriptures say, the insults of those who insult you, O oh God, well, they've fallen on me. And Paul writes, such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us not to bore us not to weigh us down but the bible was written so that we would learn from it and the scriptures here's the benefit pay attention to this give us hope and encouragement as we patiently wait for god's promises to be fulfilled see paul when he's writing to this early church they're trying to navigate life together and they're different from one another and if I can, let me just pause here and say something about the church and its togetherness, even though it's different. God's desire for the church is not to have a church for a certain group of people. See, what do you mean by that? Who are, who are just like you. Like, it's not really God's desire, like, well, you know, that's kind of the old people church. Well, what? Okay, well, that, that's, that's more the younger people church. Or that church... That church really lends to the creatives. Or it's like the scholars church. Or there's even this kind of church for like LSU people, right? Like there's that kind of church. But here's the deal. God's master plan is to build a people group known as the church where everyone comes together under Jesus. Maybe you remember from Romans chapters 1 through 4 this image of God's master plan. His master plan is to build a multi-ethnic family that what binds them together is what Jesus has done in their life in this, 
their mission. You ever met a military serviceman or woman? And sometimes when they've been on a mission field or a certain project together with other servicemen or women, and they're like bound together, even though they're from Texas or That mission gels them. This is what Jesus says about the church. Listen, Jesus bought you with his blood and you're on mission together to get the gospel out. The challenge of the church is we don't focus on what we're called to, therefore we're bored. Therefore we start picking on one another because we've lost our focus. See, mission exists because worship doesn't. The goal is not mission. Mission is the vehicle to help reach people to be in love with Jesus. But mission must exist because on this side of eternity, people still have an opportunity to meet Jesus. And for those of you that have kind of gone on your heels in the church, I think it's because you're missing the point of your life. You're living for things that have lesser value, less bang for their buck. But a gospel-centered life a life that really is radically in love with Jesus, committed to connected community, and laser focused on getting the gospel to those who have not heard it, there's no second, third, fourth vacation home that compares to that kind of lifestyle. There's no job, no new relationship, no new toy that compares to living a life with those kind of values. Because God's ultimate game plan is to bring people together. Isn't that the call of our modern culture? Bring people together. Unity. I mean, I'll just say this because I feel like I'm supposed to say it as someone who reads the Bible and it's not perfect, but tries to help other people understand the Bible. The phrase, let's come together. Let's walk in unity. It's not coming together that will work, but it's coming together in Christ and under his word. That has a pathway for success. Anything else will eventually fade, fizzle, and burn out. See, in the day that this letter was written, there was division staunchly amongst the people of God. And so in these first 13 verses, Paul is going to share, this is what I believe he shares, he shares three life lessons that I'm going to ask you to lean into this morning and two doxologies. Don't worry, we'll explain that in a moment. But these life lessons, these ways in which we as the people of God can live in light of who God's called us to be. And here's the very first one. It comes from verses 1 and 2. But it's to live with this kind of mindset, that you are over me. Now, what do you mean by that? Like an authority? Like, No. Look at what it says in verses 1 and 2. We who are strong must be considered of those who are sensitive about things like this. We must not just please ourselves. We should help others and do what is right and build them up in the Lord. Let me me provide a little bit of context by referencing the Life Application Bible and what this means to be strong. The author says... Strong believers are those who understand their freedom in Christ and who are sensitive to the concerns of others. Strong believers can function in a variety of situations and be influences for good. But but weak believers find that they need to stay away from some situations in order to maintain a clear conscience, but are both still believers and both are still seeking to obey God. Maybe you remember a message from a couple of weeks ago where the dynamic of strong and weak, it's not like, well, the guy that stands behind this, he does that only because he's reached a certain level of coastline specified status of strength and he's one of those strong believers. It's not this classification like you got your strong crew that sits up front and your, your backsliding Christians that are in the back. Like, it's not like that at all. Here's how it works. Every single one of us have areas in our, in our walk and growth with the Lord go, man, God's giving me like grace here and I can, I can be an influencer for good and in other areas we go, man, I'm really weak in that. Like when the hot donuts flash now sign, I'm just like, I need Jesus. You know, like we're in this area in our lives, all of us, where we're walking with the Lord in a dynamic of progression, not perfection. And so here's what he says, man, hang with one another, bear with one another, give a little grace for one another. 
He, here's the most solid and simple way to live your life to the fullest. Your life to the fullest as a Christian. Make it about others. It's not about what you can do, what your rights are. It's not about what you could get away with or what makes life easier on you or just pleases you, but how can I live in such a way in this decision to support those that are around me? See, here's the deal. Statistically speaking, the American culture has never lived in a moment in history where the thrust of thought and celebrated way of life is live to please yourself. Find your truth. You do you. And that's crept into the church where this mindset of, look, I know that this might hurt my church. Oh, the Lord. You have allowed the culture to creep in here and warp your understanding of how to live the fullest life in Christ. It's not about you. And yet, with this mindset, (laughs) statistically speaking, this generation is the most unhappy and depressed to date. Could it be that the way we believe is impacting the way that we live? Ask this question. In my consideration of choice for whatever the fill in the blank is, how is that going to impact the person that's to the left of me and to the right of me? Yeah, I may want to do it. It may sound fun. It may sound exciting, but let me step back. Let me think. Let me consider. Does that attitude really help that person? Attitude is a choice. It's not a reaction. You choose. Is this choice, is it going to impact my neighbors, my friends, my family? Not just, well, you can't say it's wrong. Man, you're living for lesser stuff. Don't do that. Live with this mindset. No, it's, it's, it's you above me you above me why why should I do that look at verse three for even Christ didn't live to please himself you say bummer you pulled the Jesus card yep that's what it says like as the scriptures say the insults of those who insult you oh God have fallen on me Psalm 69 here is like Jesus man he didn't have like a debt that he owed but he paid a debt that we owed that we could never pay and because of that The insults, the burden of sin, penalty fell upon him. And look at what he says in verse 4. Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to bore us on Sunday school. No, to teach us, to teach us. And the scriptures give us hope. The scriptures give us encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. Let me just share with you kind of this second principle for today. Always look to and learn from Jesus and the Bible. Life is hard. Life is challenging. Relationships can rub you the wrong way. What should we be doing? Not in a one and done sense, but what can we consistently be doing to navigate the pitfalls of life? Well, I came across some interesting research this week about people who believe in Jesus And people who don't believe in Jesus. And here's what was found. People that believe in Jesus and people that don't believe in Jesus encounter the same problems. The same temptations, the same challenges, the same potential lack of fulfillment in their work. The same unhappiness in their marriage where they're like, well that was my starter wife, now I'm going to my second wife. Like... Here's the reality. This is what like statistics show, this research. Believers and unbelievers, not only do they deal with the same stuff, but honestly the same frequency of like failure, it's the exact same. And you may go, what? The Bible says something, like how? Unless, this is where I need you to pay attention. Unless, this is the research. Believers read their Bibles at least four times a week. That's the differentiator in the samples. That when there were those believers that just kind of, you know, like tried to counteract seven days of living with 90 minutes a week, <laughs> you're going through the same stuff and you're not gonna, it's not going to work out for you. You're going to navigate the same challenges. You're going to be in the same pitfalls. 
But, but those believers who said, you know what, I'm just going to get into God's word a little. Four times a week. Here was what the stats show. That they navigated those challenges and found freedom over them when they were in a living relationship with God through his word. See, when you're in the word daily, you're constantly and consistently getting an alternative perspective on life. See, when you're in the word consistently, it's like bathing and using deodorant daily. You should do that, right? Like what if you woke up on Sunday and said, this is the day, like... Whether I need it or not, it's bath day. Like there was a generation that lived that way and no fault to that generation, but like we're not in that generation. Like every day or maybe it's twice a day for some of us, like it's the day, wash and deodorant. Like you, you can't navigate like personal hygiene like 90 minutes a week. That, that's a daily, consistent, constant thing. And here's the reality. You can't give 40 minutes at the gym and expect that to change a week of burgers, pizza, and Chick-fil-A. I am a testimony to that, man. Like, you just can't. It's consistent. It's daily. It's not. And here's the reality. Interacting with the scriptures. You know what it does? It bums us out. It brings discouragement. At that point, you should read your Bibles and go, heresy, look at verse 4. No, the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands on this. But here's the question. Have you ever been in a season where you feel like you're waiting on the Lord? For something. Something with your kids, your your business, or wherever it is. A season in life. The challenge we all face is discouragement in that. And a lack of patience. Like, well, I'm just going to make it happen. What you can't put a price tag on is hope and encouragement. And the Bible says right here, for those that are in the word, as you navigate all that stuff that we all navigate, encouragement is found there. Hope is found there. Look to and learn from Jesus in the Bible. These little bracelets, they still apply today. Like, how would Jesus respond Let that be my lens through which I'm trying to navigate this. Like, let me look at principles in the scripture. Let me just ask, what's Jesus-y right here? You know, like, what would best give glory, attention, and honor to him? How we grow and gain maturity all depends on how we look and learn from Jesus in the Bible consistently. Listen, I don't want you to miss these two simple but powerful principles. Let me just put them back up on the screen. The way to make your days doxological. We're going to unpack that in a second. You may say, you still haven't proven to me why I care about that. But wait one second. You over me. Living a lifestyle where others are more important than your own dynamics. And the second thing is just like deodorant or bathing or brushing those teeth or for some of us making sure that hair. Like always, always, always be looking to and learning from Jesus in the Bible. This does not work. If this is all you're doing to look to and learn from Jesus. I'm stoked that you're here. I'm glad you're online. I'm not saying like throw it out the window. But what I am saying is if that's it. That's the 40 minutes at the gym. But hitting Chick-fil-A. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now in verse 5. Paul shares his first of his two doxologies. Here it is. May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you to live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. And then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, a doxology, here's the definition. It's just an expression of praise to God. That's all it is. It comes from the Greek language, doxa, meaning glory or grandeur, and, and logos, meaning word or speaking. And this doxology is just a thing where where Paul writes, this is who God is. Be reminded. And here's the doxology that we see in this, this section, that God is the God of patience and encouragement. And let me have your attention, let me see your eyes. Some of you guys have a broken image of what the word dad means. You weren't modeled in your life what a good father looks like. And so when you hear the word father, you think of short fuse and critical. 
God is patient and encouraging. God is the one who is there for you. The first, second, tenth, hundredth, and thousandth time. God is the one who's there to encourage and help you. Why? To get all your dreams come true. So that you can wish upon a star and marry that right person and get that right car. No. What's he there to do? He says to help you to live in harmony with one another. Let me ask you a simple question. I'm not going to belabor this point because we'll look at it again in our second doxological scripture. But patience and encouragement. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand on this one. Could anyone do with a little bit of like patience and encouragement in their life? Good. This side, you guys are so good. You get to preach next week. You got it all down. Yeah. Patience and encouragement. That that's a tank that constantly needs to be refilled. It's not like one and done. I got patience down. Yeah, I don't need to be encouraged. I'm rock solid. You liar. But like, here's the dynamic. One way to feed that is to check on your community. Those who you're around are constantly feeding you and you're feeding off them. I'll never forget these two friends of mine. We lived in this little, I need to check the square footage. I could check on it maybe through some app or something. But we lived in this little place on this alleyway called Curly Alley in downtown Santa Barbara. Somewhere around 450 to 600 square feet. Massive, I know. Um, but we, we lived in this little, like, it wasn't called it, a, it was on an alley. We didn't even have a street. We weren't even up that far yet, but we were on an alley. And we all worked at the same church together in Santa Barbara. Known these guys for 20 years. Nate's in the middle and Jess is over there on the other side. And um, never had an opportunity to encounter two relationships in my life that exuded models of patience and encouragement like these two men. And as we've been able to kind of, you know, life, man, it's, and it's an interesting thing. It doesn't move like a straight line. It moves like zigzags and then back and then like this and like that. That's how life works. I don't like that as an outline guy. I want it to go like this. But that's not, that's not, that's not what Jesus has for me. But life kind of goes like this. And as I've seen that in my friends' lives and as we've had seasons where we're more involved in one another's lives and then less, such examples of what it's like to be patient with their children, encouraging to their spouse, navigating ministry because I'll show you a little bit of the backside of the cards of ministry it's not always like happy clappy you're just stoked to do it I'm just being honest sometimes it's like you know God you've called me to this so I'm gonna be faithful to this but this hurts or I don't understand this or I wish this would change that's the dynamics for all of us no matter what we do but who you surround yourself with has such great impact on who you become and who you're becoming. It's not a one and done deal. You need to constantly evaluate your community. I just believe this and maybe, maybe this will not make you happy, but I don't think you should be friends with everyone who wants to be friends with you. You gotta be careful who you kind of let into your, your circle of who like speaks into your life and like who encourages you and who sets perspective for you you got to choose your friends wisely because friends do impact your choices and choices eventually mold who you become and that teenage dynamic it's hard for that to become grasped but it's almost like that season in life where it's not the only important season where friendships really matter but it sure is one of them or who you choose to surround yourself will impact who you become in the next 12, 18, 24, 36 months. And then those decisions kind of impact the rest of your life. So choose who you hang with wisely. But the question is this. Are you positioning your life where you can really connect with God and experience him? God's the God of patience and encouragement. Don't raise your hand. But are you experiencing that? If not, why not? Because that's who God is. And I'm not talking about perfection in these things, but I am talking about progress. One of my mentors, he used to say this, Neil, and he's kind of like the Hulk Hogan of Bible teachers, big old guy. He would say like, Neil, you need to position yourself. Live under the spout where the blessing comes out. I was like, oh, that's cool. That rhymed and that was awesome. What does that mean? Like you need to position yourself in the way that you live where you're experiencing God. 
Like you need, to, you need to find yourself in a place where you're living. Where that's, where, that's where God's called you to. Think of Abraham from the Old Testament. He's the father of faith. God blessed him in so many different ways. But in, in the book of Genesis chapter 12, he was told to get out of his country and go follow after God, not even knowing where he was going. And he went. And as he followed God by faith, God blessed. He was under that spout. Let me put it this way. I've got this little boy in my home right now named Leo Spencer. His real name is Leonidas Ulysses Stephen Spencer, what a mouthful. But little Leo, he's about to turn two in 10 days. His brother right behind him is five today, but I took the boys somewhere where there was this shark and that's about as close as I could get little Leo to that shark. He's kind of running in that picture as you see him right there. But every single night, our bedtime routine includes water. Water, we sing songs, we do these different things that we do at night to tuck the boys in, but we always forget it. My wife and I, it's like we're about ready to tuck in. He's about ready to go down into his bed and he'll go, Wawa, wawa. Like, oh man, I forgot that stinking cup. So we'll go get the cup. And sometimes I'll give it to him. And it has this little like button on it that you have to push in order for the lid to come up. And he's not there yet. So he's always like, you know, trying to hit it. That little Leonidas, he's just like smacking it. And it's not opening. So I'll push it for him. And then he just, oh, he goes down to that little straw that he's like bit to the nub. And he like gets a little bit of wawa. And it's like, I don't even know if he gets anything, but it's like this habit that he's into. But he has to do it. Then he'll go to bed. Well, if he's not getting to that little spout, no wawa is coming out, is what I'm trying to say. And here's the reality. You and I need to position ourselves where we can really experience God. Can I, can I say this in all humility? Um, you don't need to worry about finding God's will for your life. You say, what? You need to worry about what finding out what God's will is and then position your life around his will so many of us live for God what, what, what do you want me to do me, me me there's so much me in that equation you're off balance you're not you're not going in the right direction but if you read the Bible black and white and often in red you'll find what God's will is and then you need to simply say I need to align my life to this by the power of his spirit and then here's what's happening You start to position yourself under the spout where the blessing comes out. How do I do that today? Here's a couple things we've learned so far. First and foremost, it's you over me. If you're not living that way, no wonder Christianity's boring. If you're just living for your little kingdom, me, my wife, and my kids, this is what's best for us. Family's a good thing, but don't make it a God thing. It's a good thing that you should hold on loosely, right? 38 special, like hold on loosely to everything that God gave you. Otherwise, it becomes an idol. And good things, when they become God things, become odd things, and they rob you of the intended blessing that it's supposed to be. God has to be priority. You want to position yourself in a way where the blessing's coming out? Make it about others, not just about you secondarily you've got to be looking to and learning from Jesus consistently I mean put like the dwell app on when you're putting deodorant on maybe the D's will help you remember like okay daily dwell daily deodorant okay in the Bible dwell is a Bible app if you're wondering what that is but always look to and learn from Jesus in the Bible and number three be reminded of who God is this doxology of praise God is a God of patience and encouragement that's who he is This is how you position yourself to live a life that's doxological. Now listen, the third and final biblical principle in life lesson is found in verses 7 through 12. If you're still awake and still with me, just say this like, my days will be doxological. Man, you guys are awesome. The first service laughed when I asked them to do that, but you guys did it. Okay, verse 7. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given glory. Remember that Christ came as a servant to the Jews to show that God is true to the promises he made to their ancestors. Don't miss this. In verses 9, 10, 11, and 12, he does something amazing to kind of give support to this principle that he just shared. Verse 9. He quotes from the Old Testament and saying, he also came so that the Gentiles might give glory to God for his mercies to him. That's why the psalmist, when he met and he wrote this, for this, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I'll sing praises to your name. 
Another Bible verse from the Old Testament he quotes in verse 10. And he says, in another place, it's written, Rejoice with his people, you Gentiles. Verse 11, yet again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Praise him, all you people of the earth. In verse 12, in another place, Isaiah said, The heir of David's throne will come and he will rule over the Gentiles. They will place their hope on him. Now, if you're kind of like, what is, what is Paul doing here? Honestly, he's kind of evidencing his biblical brilliance and his ability to read his audience. He knows he's about to get kicked back to what he's saying. So you know what he does? He quotes from the Old Testament showing that it's God's ultimate plan to bring everyone together. Verse 9 is a quote from Psalm 18. Verse 10 is a quote from Deuteronomy 32. Verse 11 is a quote from Psalm 117. And then verse 12 is a quote from the book of Isaiah. Now you might say, why is that so brilliant? Because good ethnic Jewish Christians lived by the Old Testament. Torah, first five books. The books of poetry, highly valued. The books of prophecy, highly, highly valued. So you know what he does? He says, let me quote from the Torah, verse 10. Let me quote from the prophets, verse 12. Let me quote from poetry, verses 9 and 11. To show... That it's always been God's plan that you and I, we should be family. That there should be this dynamic where the church is diverse. And it's not about a church where everyone looks the same, sounds the same. They all drink the same kind of coffee and like it's all the same kind of Instagram feeds. And it's like, no, that's not really the thing, man. That's going to filter out. It's a multi-ethnic family committed to being a community on mission. Now, that stuff's not like super trendy but it does last and has so for the last two millennia here's the third life lesson to learn from this and this is a little bit of the niv neil's interesting version i'll be honest but here it is third life principle we're family we're all cousin eddie say what do you mean by that like remember cousin eddie from christmas vacation this scene is classic, like Griswold just got his lights to work and he's like, all right, and then Eddie shows up and so they're in the house drinking eggnog from that little fantastic reindeer mug and <sighs> Griswold starts to learn that his, you know, Eddie hasn't really done much to, to do Christmas for his kids, so he's telling them like, hey, we want to we do Christmas for you guys and, you know, like he's such a aware self-aware person he goes you know what I even want to buy a gift for you something really nice He's like but wait that's Griswold's money anyway I digress but here's the point cousin Eddie wasn't the guy you were stoked to see pull up in your driveway and you know navigate all the things that he navigated with his RV if you know what I mean by that movie but here's the deal he's family right he's family and so Griswold maybe a little bit of like you know grinning and barren he still accepts, he still welcomes, he still tries to do life together with him. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to the person to your left and say, you're Cousin Eddie. <laughs> and then turn to the person to your right and say, you're Cousin Eddie. See, here's the reality, we're all Cousin Eddie. You say, what do you mean? We're all like, you know, we're all somebody's not favorite person. I know you think that like, why would they not like me? Like, I'll just be honest with you, like, not everybody likes everybody. Not everybody, you know, gets along. Some people like LSU, if you can believe that. No, I'm just kidding. But like, here's what I'm trying to say. Here's what I'm trying to say. The dynamic is not like, oh, well, we all shop at the same grocery stores, same kind of food. Is that almond milk? Is that like, like we all listen to the same kind of music. We all wear the same kind of clothes. Now we can be in alignment together in community. No, man, you're missing it. You're living for lesser things. My dad talked about that last Sunday in Romans, 15, uh, Romans 14. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not these things of earth. Here's the deal. We're family. Accept each other just like Jesus accepted you. I got to be honest with you, but I got to tell you something. Like when you came up on Jesus' radar of salvation, he wasn't like, oh my goodness, look who's about to get saved. We're going to change the world with that person. Like we need them on our team. Now the Bible says we're all sinners, we're all enemies of God, we didn't deserve salvation, it's not like, wow, and that's not why we accept one another. Wow, look what that person could bring to my life, look at what they could, no, we're family. We're family, accept one another, 
Do you do it because you like everything about Cousin Eddie? No. But let me just say this. And I do want to say this with humility, but I I do want to say it. We don't do this in the American church. We don't practice this kind of committed community. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. If you're part of a church and it's like theologically wrong, financial abuse, moral abuse, I think you have every right to say, oh man, I need to put some distance there. But in the American church, here's what happens. When there's disagreement, we just kind of duck out. When there's friction, and there's friction, man. Put two humans in a building, there's going to be friction. We don't fight for one another. We fight with one another and whisper about one another and gossip about one another and backbite about one another. Or when something new comes on the scene, we bail out on our commitments and our place in the church that God has us in. And it's always, you always get the God burn with that. Well, God's leading me. I can't do anything with that, man. God's leading you. And you hear God perfectly, so there you go. This is what I want to say. You're called to be committed. How in the world would your marriage work if you were never committed to one another? It wouldn't work. As soon as the tough stuff happened, you'd get going. And I think you're missing out on the benefit of a local church if you duck out every time there's disagreement. Like if Todd and Michelle say, hey, now on we're only serving almond milk as the creamer. And you're, I'm out of here, man. Bring your own little milk. Like, there's other ways. Like, but so often, like when there's challenge, we just, we just bail. And here's the challenge for you. If you're that kind of person, you're going to experience that same life lesson with the Lord in a different place and with different faces, but it'll be that same challenge. Are you going to stay connected? God doesn't allow me, and I don't think he does it for you, to just kind of like circumvent the lessons he's trying to teach us. He gives us the grace to kind of like, oh, I'm just going to sidestep it. And then you find yourself in a different place with different faces, but the same lesson. Because God wants you to grow. He wants you to grow. He wants you to develop. He wants you to mature. And this is what I want to say in humility. Man, stop it. Stop fighting with one another. Stop backbiting. Stop always finding the minutia of why you get to excuse yourself from being just obedient to the Lord. Follow him. Recognize that we're family. There's going to be challenges. But instead of fighting with one another, fight for one another. And it's a rare day when you actually see that amongst believers. It happens. I've seen it happen. But I've also seen the latter where It just doesn't. I don't think that does anything for the kingdom of God. We sung it earlier. They'll know us by our love. They'll know us by our love. And Paul says this in closing, this beautiful, powerful praise, doxology. He says, I pray that God, the source of hope, would fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust him. And then you'll overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Second doxology, but our final point. God is the God of hope. Hope. He's the God of it. It means he's the one that's over it. He's the one that where you get it. I once heard this acronym of hope this way, like hope, having only positive expectations. That's kind of like a buzzword way of thinking in our modern culture. Like have hope, man. Like here's the deal though. Hope without Jesus is a fool's errand. Like hope kind of belongs to him. He's the the God of hope. Like you can't just live your life saying, I'm just going to wish upon a star. No, we're supposed to pray to the one that made the stars, right? Like it's not just like hope and hope or faith and faith. It's faith in God. Hope in his son Jesus. That produces joy, peace. As we trust him, overflowing with confident hope and power in the Holy Spirit. See, here's the doxology of Romans 15. God is the God of patience and encouragement. God is the God of hope. 
I, I, if I could see your eyes, I, I would know that many of you need to experience that God in your life. Hope, patience, encouragement. I'm going to give you an opportunity to position your life in such a way where you can be under that spout. Here it is. Put others above yourself. Look to and learn from Jesus. And remember that we're family. Some of us this morning will go, yeah, that, that spoke to me. But then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you'll be tested in those truths. But I promise, as you're, as you're kind of in the Bible every day, as you're reading, you'll find progression in this place. Not perfection, but progression in being under that spout where, man, there's hope, there's encouragement, there's peace. Overflowing with confident hope, as he says here. So as we close, and I'll just go ahead and invite the worship team up now if I can. But our, our title for this morning, Making Your Days Doxological. It's kind of a cheesy, illustrate, or alliterated way for me to basically just say this. Man, live your life for God. You know, I like these things. Skittles. Anyone ever heard of Skittles? They're great. You know what they're designed for? Me. Like for me to take this and put it in my mouth. But what if I were to take Skittles and say, I know what these are. These are bullets for those on Sunday morning who don't pay attention to the Bible. So I'm going to throw them at people, right? Like that's what this is. All these people over here, I'm just going to toss Skittles at them. Now here's what would happen. Probably a fight, you know, eventually. But that's not the design of a Skittle. That's not what it's for. It's meant to be enjoyed. But if you enjoy it too much, you start to look like a Skittle. You get that same shape, right? It's the design of it. It's candy. It's meant to be enjoyed in moderation. You are designed to live for the glory of God. It's why you still have breath in your lungs. Some of the ways you can do that this week is to put others above yourself, to, to recognize, to always look to and learn from Jesus in the Bible, and to realize that you're part of a family. There's a lot of other ways. The Bible's full of them, of ways to live your life to the glory of God. But if you don't do it, you're not living for your intended purpose. No wonder this is so boring. I would be bored to tears if church was about me getting my spiritual needs met. Because you're just always going to be complaining. There's always something that's wrong. But if it's about God and about others and about living on mission, it's a pivot. It's a change. And you go, my goodness, how could I be thinking about suicide? I, I've got so much to do before my race is over. How could I be thinking about complaining about this person or that person? Do you see the need around me and that God wants to use me? I've got purpose. I've got meaning. See, either live your life for God or don't. Like, prove me wrong. Go live for something else. And see how that works out for you in the long run. Not the short run. Sin is pleasurable for a season, but it always bears fruit. Sow your life into the soil of the glory of God, of living for him. It's your design. It's what you're made for. If I were to use this pulpit as a battering ram, it might kind of work, but that, that's not what this is for. It's meant to just kind of hold some stuff and hide little illustrations so you can't see them. Like, that's, that's what it, it's, it's not its design. You're designed to live for God. If you're not doing that, you're living for something less. And I just want to encourage you. God's a God of hope. God's a God of joy. God's a God of peace. Just position yourself under that spout where you can experience him, where you can know him. If you don't know Jesus, it starts with confessing your sin and repenting of it and accepting him as Savior and Lord. If you do know Jesus, man, get that brain in the Bible, right? Like read the book. Have your mind constantly washed. Live for others. Don't just live for yourself. Fight for one another, not with one another. That's how we're to live as Christians. And it'll be easy peasy. You're never going to be challenged on those life lessons. No, you will. But I know the Holy Spirit's there with you. He'll be there to encourage you. 